All right, rejoining us, and it's been quite some time, is channel favorite, Dr. Justin Bronk. Justin, it is great to see you. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Let's talk about your travels, because you've been a lot of different places since we last spoke, and you've also had some flight ops, and this will sort of feed our discussion about the Ukrainian air war. But talk to us about where you've been and what militaries you've had access to and what airplanes you've flown. So in terms of uh, flying stuff the last three or four months, flew with the US Air Force um, at uh, Spangalem in Germany. Uh, July flew with the Italians on Eurofighter uh, in Joya del Colle. Recently flew with the, the Luftwaffe at uh, Nürvenich, um in Western Germany, again on, on Eurofighter. It's been interesting from a uh, seeing how different air forces um, actually do the business day to day, and particularly the contrast in the way the the kind of the crew room looks and feels, and the way people brief, and you know, even kind of intangible stuff like you know what's on the walls, what stories do the instructors sort of tell, you know, little little anecdotes. Do they tell little anecdotes? Um, how are the kind of sorties framed? How are discussions framed? Are people looking at the you know more more at the flight safety aspect? Obviously, omnipresent, but you know, how much is that stressed versus tactical aspects, you know, how you're taking your shots, um, how your, you know, deconfliction, how your, your communications pattern, all of that stuff, versus how do people frame it in the operational output terms, you know, what, how much emphasis is there on the mission and, and I guess why that why that is important. One of the topics that we've tackled, which was a, a function of a paper that you wrote at RUSI, was whether NATO is training properly for the next fight. So what is your sense after seeing all of these different NATO air forces up close? The the very strong sense I get is that the the fundamentals are still excellent in the sense that a lot of the procedures at the, at the, the underlying day-to-day -day ops and the, the way that planning and briefing and, and you know step fly, debrief, shot val, all of that stuff is done is still extremely impressive, almost universally, but that the combination of, in many cases, practical restrictions, there's more so for some countries than others, but things like airspace, you know, how much space do you actually have to train in? Therefore, what tactics can you train to in live environments? Do you have access to threat emitters? Do you have access to live weapon ranges? That kind of thing is very, very variable. And for a lot of air forces, it's very challenging actually with the um, I, you know, those sort of restrictions and also uh, in some cases, like particularly the RAF and the US Air Force, just the tempo uh, in terms of constant deployments and constant ops uh, that they have to run means that trying to stay really good at or get really good at and then stay really good at, um, keep that currency up with skills, all the different mission sets they're theoretically liable for is really, really challenging. This episode is sponsored by Ridge's new Hyper Lime Collection. The Hyperlime Collection is inspired by the fluorescent shades found in high-performance gear, a hue that speaks volumes yet serves a purpose. Like the color found in key places around an aircraft carrier's flight deck, this dynamic yellow plays an essential role in peak performance. The Ridge Wallet is the last wallet you will ever need. It expands to hold up to 12 cards, plus room for cash, all while remaining as slim as possible, unlike those bulky old dad wallets. The Ridge is designed with RFID blocking materials that protects you from digital pickpocketers. It's scratch resistant. There's an optional AirTag attachment, so you'll never have to lose your wallet again. The Ridge key case holds up to six keys and prevents them from jingling. You get up to 30% off your order when buying the Ridge wallet and the key case together. Shop the holiday sale by going to ridge.com slash wardcarroll and get up to 30% off through December 20th. That's ridge.com slash wardcarroll. And if you use my link, enter your email or SMS for a free chance to win a Ridge bundle worth $4,000. No purchase necessary. For a lot of countries, while they might have multi-role fighters, and most people do, um, most fleets are nominally committed to a lot of different mission sets. Actually, there is a, not much depth of, of expertise in a lot of the force in a lot of those mission sets just because people have to stay across so many different skills and also in many cases do all these deployments that some stuff is just really hard to deal with and you see a, an interesting contrast between experienced patch wearers so weapons instructors um, particularly people who have 10 15 years on fast jets who 
have flown in a period where they had a lot more flying um, and a lot, and in some cases, fewer task sets. Their perspective is very different to the more junior instructor pilots and junior pilots who typically in most air forces feel fairly capable. You, know, you ask them and because you know, how, how ready do you feel for this, 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 and this? And the general answer varies, but for example, in the US Air Force, generally, no, we feel pretty good at the end of each four month phase, phased work up to whatever the primary, you know, let's say defensive counter air as an entire mission set or offensive counter air, no, we feel pretty good. And you talk to those patch wearers and often the, the perspective is, no, no, they feel good because they've never really been good. So they don't actually know what really being on top of the game looks and you know, supposed to look and feel like. To my mind, it would make sense for a lot of, particularly the smaller NATO air forces, where you're having to spread a lot of those intangible day-to-day -day frictions. So aircraft availability, airspace restrictions, training serials falling out, weather disruption, you're having to spread those out over a much smaller force and therefore you have disproportionate impacts um, in an unpredictable way. I think it would make sense for a lot of those air forces to focus on fewer mission sets, but doing those mission sets better. Um, the issue is of course, no one air force can essentially deprioritize certain mission sets unless they're very confident that one of their nearby allies is going to really focus on doing that credibly and will show up and resource that mission set. So it's a bit of a first mover problem. Um, quite a few air forces, I think, would quite like to specialize. Um, they, they understand the, the challenges, but it's difficult for somebody to go first. So in the most general sense, do these air forces seem professional and motivated? Professional, yes. Motivated, it very much varies by nation. For example, you know, it was quite noticeable that there was a lot more of a kind of cynical outlook from a lot of the German pilots uh, I spoke to on squadron, particularly the more junior ones, who basically didn't see much root or much prospect of getting much more serious in terms of their, their operational output. Uh, you know, being able to carry live weapons a lot more, to do much more flexible use of airspace, to train in a more realistic fashion because of the political constraints, you know, it's, it's not really the Luftwaffe's fault, but because of the political constraints that the German system puts on the military in Germany, uh, you know, th there was, I think, a bit of a, a, a suppressive effect on morale there. Yeah, it's, they're still very professional and in many cases still seem to really enjoy the work and they, they, they clearly work very hard. But I think there's a significant degree of cynicism there in terms of, yeah, but we're kind of just going through the motions a lot of the time. Whereas um, in Sweden, for example, really pretty high morale um people feel look look and feel pretty focused uh that's partly because they have a very stable system so when you join a swedish uh, fighter wing as a junior pilot just out of flight training you are expected to be there for 20 25 years uh, and so you know you will stay in that wing you might move between the two squadrons in the wing but generally you'll stay in that wing put down roots there and just really focus on slowly and intensively growing into that really complex dispersed operations model for your primary air to air mission set and whatever the secondary mission set is for that wing. Um, and that gives people, I think, a sense of focus and a sense of credibility, particularly now that there's more money going into defense in Sweden. You know, Canada, there's some um, significant limitations for, for people's morale in terms of they're having real struggles with maintaining their, their really old F-18s um, because of the, the, the length of time it took to get a political decision to actually buy the F-35. Uh, they got lost kind of 10 years. And so that fleet is having to go much longer than it was envisaged. Um, and that brings a lot of issues and a lot of challenges and means that because of the in inherent limitations of a legacy Hornet uh, and, you know, to a degree, some procedural issues and, uh, and some limitations in terms of equipment, weaponry, airspace, training opportunities, there is some cynicism, for example, in that fighter community that they don't feel that they're actually really capable in a lot of the mission sets that they're liable for. But in that case, it doesn't it doesn't seem to impact the commitment to want to do the job and to be professional. It's just kind of leads to everyone being really cynical and, and retirement rates being quite high, particularly among instructors, because you get you can kind of deal with that frustration up to a certain point, but then you kind of hit major level and, and you know you get a lot more retirements than than is ideal. And the US Air Force, yeah, people are professional, cheerful, motivated. Uh,
but of course, compared to any other NATO air force, there's just so much resource pumped into that machine that, you know, of course they are. Um, they generally don't fly a massive amount more than a lot of NATO partners, you know, in some cases less than, for example, the Italians um, and the Germans seem to fly a bit more than your average USAF fighter wing. But the quality of those sorties in the USAF is often much higher in terms of the training value because they can put much larger formations up with tankers and other enablers much more frequently and train with more weapons releases and go to more exercises and do more deployments. And so there's less of the either what's this for or the we're just so behind the drag curve feeling that in, in some air forces gets people down. And that'll do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash Ward Carroll. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.